Win £25,000 with Paddy's Pick 5. Pick 5 winners from our five races to win. Paddy Power. Hello everyone, welcome to Road to Cheltenham. This is a show that concentrates on action, but last weekend, in Britain at least, it was inaction that stole so many of the headlines with three big name horses not running at Ascot. Now, this story has been examined from lots of different angles, from the poultry graded and Saturday programme in Britain, uh, for some intemperate language that has been used, um, climate change has been discussed as well, and whether people who went to Ascot got value for money but Ruby Walsh wants to look at this story from a different angle don't you Ruby? Yeah look I mean what's the root of some of the problems now like the, the programme that's a different issue where are all the horses gone that's could that debate could rage for much longer than we have in the show but the ground and to me like, people talk about race courses facilities value for money etc etc the most important thing at any race course is the actual track of course so I want to talk about the tracks and I'm not a farmer, but I am married to a farmer's daughter, and I see how much work my father-in-law puts into ground, turf, etc. And you look at some of our race courses and you wonder, is it the same? If we just look at, look, these are all snapshots from July. So we've Newbury. The green strip is the flat course. You can see the jump track where the red bet bookmaker's hoarding and the fences are all burnt off. Sand down, we have Andrew Cooper on the line. To me, it looks green all the way. You can see the middle of the race course is burnt, but that's not the track. Bottom left is Haydock, where we raced last weekend. Flat course into the bookmaker's hoarding, that's your second flat course. Inside that is your chase and hurdle track, but you've got to get to the infield before it's burnt off. So Haydock obviously maintained our track in the summer, Newbury allowed theirs to burn off, and the bottom right is Ascot. Now the race, rail closest to the camera is the hurdle rail. They're the horses in 2019 on Champions Day at Ascot, the rail outside them is the flat track. In 2019, Ascot had Champions Day on the hurdle track. So in 2022, why didn't they have the Coral Hurdle card on the flat track? Interesting question. In there, you've mentioned the phrase burnt off. Just go into detail about what that means. Look at the grass. I mean, there are two trains of thought. Do you mind and continue maintenance throughout the summer on your tracks to keep moisture in the ground, to keep the grass growing, or do you allow them to burn off? Now, ecologically, there is a theory. I don't have the evidence. As I said, it's not my background. That by allowing it to burn off, it does create, bring worms into the ground and can do different things to it. But when you look at the tracks, that's Newbury in July, four months ahead of this weekend's action. There doesn't look to be any care taken. I believe we're not on the flat track in Ascot or in Newbury this weekend because five months ahead of the Greenham, they're minding the flat track. So you, are you suggesting now that jumping is a second class citizen? It would have, you look at that, I'm, yeah, I am suggesting that. Yep. Didn't Leopardstone have some similar problems? They did. They didn't maintain their chase track for a couple of years. Two years ago at the Dublin Racing Festival, you ended up with three or two. Was it a match, the Leopardstown Gold Cup mm -hmm. um, or the Irish Gold Cup? This summer, Leopardstown have. They've been aerating and watering their chase track all summer, trying to get it back to where it was. I was there in September, four months ahead of its meeting at Christmas, and they were aerating and watering their chase track. Maintenance is a huge thing. Andrew Cooper joins us. It's an expensive thing, Andrew, but it's surely a massive thing. Uh, yes, Ruby. I, you know, I'm listening listening to this uh, with fascination. I mean, obviously, you know, my observations are really restricted to Sandown Park. You know, in in this respect, I, th I think in terms of the, you know, sort of a, certainly our experiences this summer uh, and going into the early autumn were that because as as a dual purpose racecourse, such as such as Newbury, such as Ascot, such as Haydock, other tracks you've mentioned. We were so busy, flat out, watering the flat courses to keep them at or near good to firm, that certainly from my own experience, I felt I wasn't able, and it, it's not to do with cost from my point of view, it was literally hours in the day, hours in the day, hours in the day, manpower, etc., cetera, to, to, to do what, I would have liked to have done to sand down steeplechase course during the summer and autumn. Whereas, you know, be, because of the absence of rain, flat out on the on the on the um, irrigating the, the 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 flat course, we got the odd spin into the chase track certainly during the summer. Really, just 
I mean, I, you know, we talk in terms of letting it burn off. I don't think we're consciously doing that. We we like to keep a little bit of growth within the within the plant, but but it's it it, it really was a very very challenging summer and autumn that I think all courses certainly in the south of this country have come off. So, so Andrew, what? What does that mean for the future? Because th it could be that the patterning of weather that we have seen this summer starts to be more normal, starts to be more routine. So what can racing as a whole do about it? Well, it's interesting. I mean, I, 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 I'm very reluctant to get too, too into the, tr the overall trends in this area because I think it's, you know, I think I've got records going back about 25 years at somewhere like Sandown. Uh, you know, in terms of rainfall, and, and, and they were incredibly dry summers and dry years back in within within that time frame. You know, we've had a particularly dry one just gone. Although last summer, for example, twenty twenty one was a particularly wet summer. Mm. We barely had to irrigate the flat track at Sandown Park all of last summer. But obviously, that meant we came into the autumn and the jump season in a better condition. And this this autumn, we've all been, to, to be fair, I mean, slightly playing playing catch up, and there's still a a little bit of a deficit in most of our in in, in our um, uh, jump tracks uh, over here because of that. So, in terms I mean, of what, go on. I'm sorry. No, you go no, on. Sorry, in terms, I mean, again, using Sandown as an example, mindful of this, and we we our last major flat meeting is, pro is probably the, is the sort of end of August, the Solario Atalanta meetings, and we do we do have a couple of midweek meetings in September, uh, flat race meetings. And I certainly think as a, as a longer term thought, perhaps having a more truncated flat season at the autumn end, you know, on the assumption that Sandown, as I'm sure it will, remains a dual purpose course with a lot of shared turf. Um, you know, you could look at, at, at the sort of length of your of your season to be able to perhaps to turn your attention if you need to sooner to, to sooner to the jump track than would perhaps sometimes be the case. Andrew, also, like you obviously have your Tallworth Hurdle meeting in early January. So if you water extensively at this time of year, do you risk losing that fixture? And therefore, should racing possibly in the early, late autumn, early winter, maybe be at the summer tracks that have been watering all year rather than trying to water our winter tracks? Yeah, it's an interesting. I mean, Ruby, as you know, Sandown, Sandown is a... Is a is a challenging course to manage in turf terms. I must admit, primarily because you know the, the hurdle track is the flat track. Um, you know we are we are racing at the moment on the hurdle track is a is, is a course that has been watered all summer. But even 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 that this particular autumn, it's it's remarkable how it's taken the rain. I mean, you'd be racing on probably soft ground over hurdles at the moment at at um, at, at Sandown. The chase, tr the chase track, because it's not seen the summer watering, would currently sit, as we speak, somewhere between sort of good to soft and good. Um, it's, yeah, I, it's a very well-drained, you know, I know sometimes that seems to have drainage uh, challenges, but it is an exceptionally, exceptionally uh, thoroughly drained course now. Yeah. I, I think in terms of watering at the right times of the year and worrying about I, I think you've just got to deal with the here and now to some degree in terms of our our sort of our ground preparation of tracks um you know Sandown as I say is a track it's hurdle track it's toll with ground you, you don't have to go near it with a watering can it's chase track is a very different proposition okay Andrew I'd love to chat about this more but we've got a packed program thank you very much for your thoughts and your time we very much value them and we, here on Road to Cheltenham, are going to look at the Two Mile Hurdlers next. So we had been hoping to see Constitution Hill at Ascot on Saturday, but he was the one of the horses that was pulled out. Happily, he runs in the Fighting Fifth this Saturday. More of that later. We did, however, had a significant performance in this division from State Man in the Morgiana, beating Sharjah. Again, more of that later. First off, Ruby is going to set the scene of where we were at the end of last season. And obviously, it was with Honeysuckle, 16 times unbeaten mare, twice the champion hurdle winner. Yeah, look, at the end of Punchestown in 2022, we were in the same place we had been in 2021. It was Honeysuckle. She follows the same format every year, same route. She will start in Ferry House in three weeks' time and look, most likely win the Hatton's Grace again. Last year, we watched her winning it. She was work woman-like when she beat 
uh, Ronald Pump in last year's race. Um, it wasn't spectacular, but that's what Honeysuckle does. One day, onto Leperstown, beat Santa here in Echoes and Rain. Champion Hurdle beat Epitant, back to Punchestown. And a bit like 2021 in 2022, she just got home. Mm. But that's what she's a habit of doing. And that probably, your next question is going to be about ratings, I know it is. <laughs> but you can only rate any horse on what they're beating. I take the point that she, she just beats what is there, but I do think it's interesting, bearing in mind she's about to be facing a novice as good as Constitution Hill is, and we discussed that last week, didn't we, with Davey. Time form and Racing Post ratings between them have the best of what she achieved last season, four to six pounds below the best of what she achieved the previous season. Yeah, and look, it probably is, but I think she's that kind of animal, and she just about wins, and therefore you can only rate her X amount of distance in front of what she's beating. That's how handicapping works. Yeah, yeah. So this year, if she happens to go and beat Constitution Hill, does that mean she is probably 15 pounds a better mare than she was last year? I doubt it. No, you have to have the ideal circumstances in which to express your ability, which leads me neatly onto the Supreme. Yeah, and he was spectacular. Dysart Dynamo, John Bond, um, you know, even when Dysart Dynamo got it on his own, John Bond took him off and then this happened off the home turn. Constitution Hill just opened up like a horse in fourth gear and has gone and hosed up. It was a brilliant performance. It was an exciting performance. John Bond, favour for the arc, killed Crud is back in third. He's gone and won his, his beginner's chase first time out. The form is solid. He's a rock solid horse. It's going to be really, really interesting. But I, I agree with David Russell. He's going to have to go and beat Honeysuckle. Absolutely. That's the, that's the joy of it. Races are, can, can be different and you have to learn to be able to win in different ways. And that's, that's the thing that Honeysuckle can do. Whatever the way the race is run, she still wins it. And she's never been beaten. Boban? Four-year-old, and it can be hard for four-year-olds. He's obviously good in the triumph last year, Pied Piper, Field Door. Here he is back at Punchestown, um, beating Field Door again. They were long clear of Villette Tomp, who ran in the maiden hurdle today. So, you know, Vauban, he was impressive, but four-year-olds, it'll be the springtime before you can judge whether he's up to champion hurdle level or not. Again, we will come back to that. State man, you also need to mention, where he was at the end of last season. He didn't start the season so well, and is that why he ended up in the county rather well, than a graded race? Well, he fell in a maiden hurdle at the second last in Leperstown. Took him a little while to get over it. Mm. That was his... He'd had loads of runs, um, and he won a maiden hurdle at Limerick, and then got a rather attractive mark and bolted in the county hurdle. But look, his last run at Punchestown in the two and a half mile novice hurdle is a solid run. Now he's not beating Kilcrote as far as Constitution Hill did. Tree strike, life, flame bear, it's solid form. He put himself in the picture and at the weekend he didn't do himself any harm. Okay, so that is where we are at the end of last season. Now we need to talk about what's happened already. The Morgiana. Now, this was very interesting. It was obviously a Willie Mullins be benefit. He had the first, second and third. How did you see this before? Uh, and not for man? the first time that's happened either. You probably could wonder, should the race still be a grade one or not? It could be open to debate. A couple of renewals have only been OK. Um, but look, what could statement do? He's high at the first, better at the second. But watch him versus Charge in the air here at the third hurdle. Charge is low and slicker. Look at his hind end statement, gets up a little higher, Charge just stays low. Goes right here. I'm not sure, did Paul just allow him to go right or does he have to go right? Because he went right at that next hurdle as well. But he goes straight here now, misses this one, and Salier gets away on him a little bit in front. Second last, he jumps up to Salier in front and then gets the run on, on Charger. That can happen at Punchestown. It was Sharjah versus Stateman, and he gets away from him on the downhill into the straight. It's only ever so slightly, but he quickens away. Looks like he's going to bolt in here, gets a bit tired going to the last, mm -hmm. and then wins. But he still beats Sharjah impressively. Salier third, and Jesse Evans, who's rated 147, is back and forth. Good starting point. Could you ask for any more? First run out of an out of novice grade? No. Hurricane Flay got beaten in that. I thought Willie Willens was interesting afterwards. In it, He clearly thinks he's got to work on his jumping and he was talking about running him twice between now and the champion hurdle. He, he said Christmas and the Dublin Racing Festival, so I'm assuming Matheson and but Irish That's the hurdle. route Hurricane Fly always would have mm -hmm. went. Um, Faheen didn't go that route because you were initially avoiding Hurricane Fly with him, so he went Coral Hurdle Christmas Hurdle. Um, whereas, and then went to Leperstown, whereas Hurricane, whereas Hurricane Fly used to go Morgiana, Matheson, Dublin Racing Festival, and that's the way Statement will go. I'm just thinking it's good news for racing fans, isn't it? Because it means State Man runs up against Honeysuckle in the Dublin Racing Festival mm. and up against Sharjah again, and Sharjah being primed for five wins, hopefully, yeah, in, in the, the Matheson. Matheson. Yeah, and look, Sharjah's an incredible record at 
at Leperstown. He's a dual Morgiana winner as well. Um, Were so you disappointed with him there? Because Willie Mullins said he was afterwards. I, I'm not sure I was. Look, I got beaten on Faheen in that race purely because Nicholas Canyon in front of me got the run on me. Sharjah was following Stateman. And that can happen at Punchestown. Look, we have Faheen here. Nicholas Canyon jumps the second last much better, which we saw Stateman doing onto the bend. And it's David Mullins here. He allows me to get to his tail. I've had to work to get to his tail. And then he goes. He run ever so slightly down here really quickly. And he gets away from me. We saw Stateman open up on Sharjah there at the, in the same race a while ago. It was a great ride that day from David. If I had it again, I wouldn't have got beaten. Yeah. I'm not suggesting Sharjah could beat Stateman. <laughs> But there's no way I'd get beaten Faheen if I had yeah. him again. And Faheen was, you know, at the top of his game at the time. He'd won a champion hurdle. He went on to deliver a career best, didn't he, in the Irish champion, so... But Punchestown can suit the person that gets first run. Um, Sharjah, though, is nine rising ten. Yeah. My age be catching up on him? Oh, yeah, but look, even if it is catching up on him, he's four Matheson hurdles, a Galway hurdle, two more Guianas, one... I'm not one, him. Whatever, it, it could be catching up on him. There's no doubt it could. And Stateman, the other thing that Willie Mellon said that was interesting was that he's definitely got the engine for what's required this season? Yeah, I think he, he could have, yeah. There's no doubt. Look, time will tell. Um, and I think he will jump slicker. Going faster, he'll settle better. I think more experience will come down. OK. There were some other interesting things that Willie Mullins said on this day, and we've clipped out a couple of things that he said. He said that the three that he ran, Stateman, Sharjah and Seldia, were just walk working better than the other horses that he had entered. He had six. Two of those were Sir Gerhard and Verban, and this is what he had to say to Gary O'Brien. No Vauban or Sir Gerhard today. Are we oh. far off seeing them, do we think? Uh, not not person to run them yet. They haven't just shown me what I want to see. Mm. You don't like to run them until you see what you want to see work-wise, I yeah, guess that's I it, isn't uh, it. I think so, yeah. No point, you know, with horses like that just running them for the sake of running them. Mm. Okay, so plans on hold for those two? Yeah. Yeah. They'll they'll come, you know, they'll come in their own time when they're ready. Uh, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> they're always, they're always, we're always hoping that, you know, you can go back to the previous year's form. You know, it doesn't always happen. Uh, sometimes they just, for some reason, they don't uh, click in the, in the season that's in it. But um, I'm sure they will come. I thought that pause and the... <laughs> smoke volumes. If you're on the gallop, you see it five times a day, Lydia. Um, <laughs> but... I think definitely it was more to do with Vauban and I think when you look at four-year-olds going into champion hurdle years, if you go back to our Connor, mm -hmm. his first run was in the November handicap or the October handicap as it was at Nace, he completely blew out and didn't run then until Christmas where he was well beaten, improved to the Dublin Racing Festival and it was, looked like he'd improved again when he took that fatal fall at Cheltenham. So four-year-olds can take a little time. Espar Dallam was the last four-year-old winner. He didn't run in open company until February when he beat Wicklow Brave at Nace. He went to the Fishery Lane last week at Nace as a four-year-old. Mm. He went to Limerick at Christmas as a mm. four-year-old and then with a weight allowance won a grade two at Nace in February time when he beat Wicklow Brave. So four-year-olds can take time to mature and catch up with the older horses. I wouldn't be, like, Vauban, it'll be Christmas time or after before you can judge whether he's good enough to be a champion hurdle horse or not. Is it possible then we won't see Vauban until the new year for his difficult second album? Yeah, I'd say so. It, it, it is, and it's the, the reason, like, do you go with them as a triumph horse or do you keep them to be a supreme horse? It's catch-22. Do you spend last year doing nothing or do you spend this year trying to find a race? It's a difficult one with horses. But Sir Gerhard, you said last week that he's uh, already schooled over He has schooled over fences, so. yeah, and he seems to be in good form. I would be surprised if he doesn't go on novice chasing, but Willie Mullins, in the 25 years I've worked for him, has surprised me many times. <laughs> right, OK, let's have a look at what happened in the Coral Ascot hurdle. Of course, we didn't have Constitution Hill, but we did have Goshen, who beat Bruin Episcopal. Yeah, look, obviously we, we can't watch it, we don't have the pictures, but uh, Goshen... He was tough, he kept going, um, and he's admirable. Like he, he, all right, he's a bit like the weather. He's good, he's bad, he's up, he's down. Um, but I'd love to see him going three miles. I was so pleased to see this. I mean, I'd said only, only was it last week or was it two weeks ago, time flies at the moment, it's constantly teetering into one, that I'd think that he should be st kept to the, the flat. But I was so pleased to see him do this. Uh, it was tremendous. And, and me too. And, you know, it was a magic half hour for the Moors with both Takas winning at, at Haydock mm. as well. Uh, good performance from him. But I just think Goshen outstayed, brewing up a star. Yeah. 
OK, let's have a look at the champion hurdle betting to see where we are and the reaction from primarily State Man. He's now clear third in behind Constitution Hill, who, as we discussed last week with Davey, even many favourite Honeysuckle 7-2 for Bam 10s. Yeah, and look, obviously Pied Piper, does he run in the fight in 50? He was an entry at one stage. Uh, Bob Ollinger, time will tell whether he'll go up or down. Epitant, so we'll know more after the weekend for her. Um, look, obviously Ghost is not in that betting. He's not a champion hurdle horse, but... Love to see him in the long walk. OK, let's have a look at the Fighting Fifth Depths. Pied Piper isn't there, but Constitution Hill is taking on Epitant. Not so sleepy, who dead-heated in this race with Epitant is also there. And the field is made up by Tommy's Oscar, switching back from fences, and Voix du Rêve is there also. Let's talk Epitant, shall we? Ah, she's a really good mare. Um, obviously faced a stiffer challenge now than she would have done. But uh, that's like, this is her at entry, winning over two and a half miles. Zanna here and herself, and she was always going to be, you now he fell at the last, I think she was going to win anyway. Uh, Mon Morale, uh, guard duty, is it, that unseats Sam Twiston uh, when trying to avoid the stricken Zanna here. But look, at Baton, she's a really good mare. But is she going to be a champion hurdle loss or a mare's hurdle contender? It's a more mare's hurdle contender for me. We'll talk about that shortly. How do you see her faring against Constitution Hill here? I think not so sleepy makes the race because he'll go forward. At least you're guaranteed some sort if of a gallop. If he gets forward, this is uh, not so sleepy we're talking yeah, about. I know that, but when you get you're riding Constitution Hill, Nick and Aidan Coleman, are they going to leave not so sleepy at the start, or are they going to let the one in that they think they can beat be the pacemaker? I think they'll let him in the race. They'll mm -hmm. wait for him to get off mm -hmm. and use him as a pacemaker. Okay, and so you, I interrupted you when you made your point about not so sleepy. How do you see it tactically between Epitant and uh, Constitution Hill? Nick will sit second, Aidan Coleman and sit third. Tommy's Oscar will sit behind him, and I don't know what Void will do. Okay, and let's talk about... He could do Tom one or the other. He could go forward, but not so sleep here, he'd sit last. Let's have a look at Tommy's Oscar, shall we? This is his best performance last season as a hurdler. He's now switched to fences. This was a, a win at Musselburgh for mark of one five zero. If he puts up his very best performance, and I think he's better suited by flat tracks, you know, he could run very well here. Could he? I think so. He's been chasing, he's got to come back down now to hurdling to a grade one against horses that haven't been jumping fences. I think it'll be hard for him. Um, would Constitution Hill or Epitant have been as decisive as that, as that in that handicap hurdle? Oh, obviously, hurdle? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think he's a bit to go. Yeah. I'm a Tommy's Oscar fan, but I think they went the right avenue to see if he could win a grade one. His best chance was going to be in an obvious chase. So your concern is, if we have a look at Phil Dorr, your concern is how a horse that's switching from fences back to hurdles might actually attack you his don't obstacles. don't have... Look, watch Phil Dorr here. When he should stand out, he doesn't. He shortens and pops because yeah. he's been schooled over fences. And even at the second fence, it's more of a jump than a hurdle. He bends his knees and gets up in the air. It's beautiful, but that's more of a jump. Now, when you're Tommy's Oscar going in against Constitution Hill and Epitant, when you actually need everything going in your favour, you don't want to be giving away two hundreds of a second no. at each of the jumps as well. I guess what I'm saying is that I think Epitome would have to be at, uh, give one of her better early season performances uh, to make sure that she finishes second behind Constitution Hill. I think Tommy Oscar at his very best, even with the £7 allowance, might. I think it could be close between them, Partic uh, particularly tactically, you know, what, how Tommy Oscar is, is ridden. Is he ridden just to pick up the pieces? Oh, I would, anyway. Mm. Mm. Anyway. We shall, we shall we'll find out more. We'll be able to discuss this this time next week. We need to talk about the uh, Cheltenham Mayor's Hurdle, um, the Close Brothers David Nicholson Mayor's Hurdle. This is the betting. I mention this because, of course, this avenue has opened up for Epitant since she won the entry hurdle that you've just described, Ruby. She is joint favourite with Brandy Love. Marie's Rock, last year's winner, is there at Seven Talon, along with last year's runner-up at Sevens, Queensbrook, and Love Envoie, who won the Dawn Run at the same meeting, the novice event. She is 8-1. to one. Let's start by breaking down the mayor's hurdle from last season. Yeah, but look, it was a fascinating race to watch. Down to the second last hurdle then, there was... The melee and heart, you were you were stuck to this. What's going to win? Martella Sky in the fatigue, tell me something got her left a shot in the fatigue goes, brings her down and uh, Mrs. Milner gets badly interfered with. Look, thankfully they all got up. Marie's Rock beats Queen's Brook, but you're thinking, or I was thinking on the day, ah, oh, she was a lucky winner. Until she went back to punch and absolutely hosed up. So you're thinking, mm, maybe she wasn't the lucky winner. Um, but I did think, tell me something, girl was travelling really well. I thought Mrs. Milner looked unlucky. And you throw in a couple of good novices from last year. And we've seen a couple out already this year. We Queen's broken and Punchestown at the weekend. And she was good. It was her second start. She looked really unfit at Limerick on her first start. And I think she improved when she went to Punchestown then to take on Heaven Help Us again. And 
it was a two horse race. There's no doubt about that. First and second hurdles, they both, you know, they were they were just in a different league, but they are good mares, and this race has become stronger over the years. I hope the mayor's chase will eventually catch up like the mayor's hurdle. But you can see yourself in heaven help us. First two all the way. Trying to get to the third hurdle in a country mile in front. Uh, Jack Kennedy moves up to heaven help us uh, at the third last. He's no doubt about stamina on Queensbrook. She stays really well. Jumps the second last much better than heaven help us. And it's all over then. Good performance. She was... I wouldn't say it. Was she unlucky last year? I didn't think she was. Interesting comment from a stable tour I read from Gordon Elliott was that she had an interrupted preparation going into Cheltenham and that he was surprised that she ran that well. And well, then she's the one. Look at her the whole way down there. She's only doing enough. Mm. She's really stepped forward from her she first has, run, yeah. hasn't she? Turned it round with Heaven Help Us. Uh, she was going to. I, I thought she would, fitness-wise, definitely. Heaven Help Us is a busy filly. She probably does plenty at home. OK. We'll come back to a current bit of form later, but we need to just look back on what the novices that will be stepping up into open company did, the mares, last season. Uh, so, Love Envoy, what did you make of her in the dawn run? Oh, she was very good. Um, you know, Johnny Burke rolled over Harry Fry. It was a good performance. She travelled uh, quite well, landed in front over the last, and she does keep at it well. I thought it was a good performance. Grangy, I'm not, I think Grangy has been retired, I stand to be corrected, um, but I think she goes at it. She kept at it really well, and to be fair to Harry Fry, he went from there and brought her back to Ferry House, where she took on uh, Brandy Love. Who was withdrawn on the day, wasn't she, at Cheltenham, yeah, by the vet a, that was on course? Yeah, she was an on-runner on the day, and then they went back to the Grade 1 in Ferry House, and Brandy Love got the better of Love and Boy. Now, you could say, well, maybe Brandy Love was a bit fresher, she didn't have that race at, at Cheltenham, which would be a point, but Brandy Love goes mad left. She always does, though. This yeah, was actually she, better than when she ran there early I in the know, season. But you'd have to think Chatham was going to be sooner or better, yeah. wouldn't you? Yeah. Dino Blue is back and forth. She bought in a novice chase this weekend. So that could, those two novices from last year could be strong form. This is quite an exciting division, I think, which is not a sentence I thought I'd often say. I'm glad to hear you saying it. And I think Davy didn't think so last week, but I think the mayor's chase could get that way over time as okay. well. You, It'll be interesting if Epiton gets on against them, but the majority of them aren't. I know you say it takes away from a runner in the champion hurdle. I do. Honeysuckle runs in the champion hurdle. Mm -hmm. She's the best As of she them. she should do. And she does, and she's the best of them. And it leaves races for the second tier of mares. I think it's Shouldn't great Epitant. to have that many rares in there. Shouldn't Epiton be running in the champion hurdle? She was second last year. Yeah, but who wants to... F oh, I hate finishing second. Who the hell wants to finish second? <laughs> Run the race, you can win. <laughs> um, Miranda is the other one. Yeah, she, let's Molly have a look Zyzwish, at Martello Sky. Yeah, she yeah. She, and she did a job on them at Kempton the other day. Um, jumped really well. Martella Sky was probably a little bit keen uh, with Bryony and Miranda. I always thought was galloping over Molly's Ollie's wishes, who had won well at Haydock. Rap, raps this hard, but doesn't lose any ground. And off the home turn, it's only a matter how far Harry Cobden wants to go and win. Martella Sky missed that and eventually gets by Molly's Ollie's wishes. But good performance from Miranda. She goes to the long walk next, the winner, Miranda. Yeah, I know, and she, she'll run a race. I hope Goshen's there to take her on. <laughs> Is that what you'd like him to do? I'd love to see him there. OK. OK. Well, that will be interesting. We'll be focusing quite a bit on the Stayers Hurdle next week, I think, as a result of seeing the Long Distance Hurdle. We'll be talking about that at the end of the show. So that's where we are with the two-mile slash two-and-a-half-mile hurdlers, the horses that will be heading towards the two-mile, down the two-mile hurdle route, and also the mares. Um, it's, it's really interesting. This is such an exciting division this time round, don't you think? Both of them. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Yeah, absolutely. But there's a crisis. <laughs> right. So that's the end of uh, that section. Next, we're going to hear the viewer video question. Let's hear from James Barber. Hi, Lydia. Hi, Ruby. Do you think horses' height and weight should be published as part of the race card? Surely two horses rated the exact same will find it easier or more difficult to carry top weight if one is 70 in hands versus 50 in two. Thank you. Now, I thought this was a really good question, but it's also a really hard question to answer. So I asked, recruited David Johnson from Timeform for his view. And this is what that he had to say. Obviously, he's from Timeform, so he thought there was a, ca a case for weights being published and stored. He'd be in favour of a horse being weighed on arrival at the track. He says there's logic to the point it made in the question that carrying about carrying weight. He thinks the most salient point is the general advantage enjoyed by higher weights and handicaps. The effect of weight isn't linear and class tends to overcome it, e.g. a Trucian or a Froden might look better on paper off top weight in a handicap than off levels in a group of grade one. Size two would always be useful to know with regards to a horse changing discipline, size to jump and obstacle, etc. Physical descriptions are still an important part of the time form comment e.g. type to make a chaser. What's your view, Ruby? I'd love to know what is the type to make a chaser. 
tends to be sort of rangy, tall, scopey horses, doesn't it? As Big box to small. springs to mind. <laughs> Big, tall, strong horse. Does Willie weigh his horses? David should be a bloodstock agent. Does Willie Mullins weigh his horses? He does, yeah. Willie Mullins weighs his horses, uses them. Yeah, I do agree with that. You could most definitely weigh horses. Now, it, would have to, it wouldn't be in a race card, I'm afraid, because you would have to do it on arrival to the race course, Absolutely. and it'd be a weight sheet like if they have a greyhound racing. So I would no issue with that. But, I mean, Peter Crouch is tall. So is Mario, I told you but they're different builds. So when it comes to cover and weight, that'd be more relevant. Is a horse strong enough to carry the weight? Yeah. Uh, is a horse a chaser? I won the top and chase on 11 stone, eight or nine on Guanaco. He was the height of the counter. Well, if you take Ellie May, she's a tiny little thing. Pony. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure, so sure. And that's what, how people sell horses, buy horses, they give opinion, they inflate them, they waffle and they make them great. And <laughs> but uh, weight, weight is an important thing though, and I agree with you. Weight, weight, is, weight yeah. on arrival, that yeah. would be different. And over time, you would have a pattern of a horse's weight. Yeah, definitely would agree with you there. You could have a pattern over time. Yeah. Um, you know, and Obviously what, a horse would develop as well though. So yeah, if they're three young. to four, four to five. Yeah. Um, yeah, of course they would. And obviously a horse then would lose significant weight when he'd be gelded. So, to be different things. You know what the problem with all of this is, isn't it? It's just money. 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 Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because, because you'd need the, the equipment and you'd need the personnel to oversee it, the weighing process as well. Because as you say, it has to be done as they arrive in the yard because one, it's the most relevant weight and two, it has to be a, a properly covered integrity process. Yes. Because otherwise it could be manipulated. In other words, it'd be a beauty, wouldn't it? <laughs> huh? Yes. Him there. He's 40 kilos above his last win and weight. Stick that down. <laughs> Get stuck in. <laughs> you sound like you've thought this through too much for my liking. <laughs> uh, right, let's move on to uh, Staying Chasers next. You have to respect Nicky's record in the race, really, you know? But the way things are going, you'd have to fancy an Irish. Yeah, same with the Hennessy. I mean, yeah, but it's not cold. Ah, it's a Hennessy to me. Always will be. It's kind of the way I am, you know, a bit old school. You know, don't want to give in. Right, well. Yeah, the Hennessy. Great race. But uh, you lads fancy anyone for the Whitbread? The Whitbread. The race that isn't until April. It hasn't been called that for over 20 years. That's the one. The old Whitbread. I still call it that as well. The old Whitbread. Won, of course, by uh, Desert Orchid. Old Desi. Desi, I called him. Very big grey. Just popping from fence to fence. Sight for sore eyes. In the glory days. Glory days of racing. <laughs> So the Betfair Chase was the main event in terms of the racing over the weekend and it was quite compelling because we had the eclipse of the Gold Cup winner, Apluto, who was a brilliant winner in the race last year and a really good performance from the horse on the inside there, Protector, out to win. Yeah, but it's uh, Harry Skelton's body language to Rachel Blackmore's back of your shot, they were both highlighted a moment ago. This is the third fence, just look at Harry Skelton on land and slow and Protector out down. I didn't see Rachel Blackmore slow a blue tar, tar down at any stage in this race. And the jumping was all protector at compared to a blue tar. He fiddles, a blue tar fiddles, protector at wings. This vent here, Bristol de Mai, was a great sight in front. But look at the difference of protector at and a blue tar. Lengths, every jump. Uh, this is the last of the circuit to go on. And landing here, Rachel, you'd never look confident. Harry's tucking in for cover, first down the back. Look where he lands compared to where a blue tar lands. He lands up behind Bristol de Mai, whereas Rachel is trying to find ground, trying to get in there. To me, he just never got off the boat because he was never at the races. Uh, last down the back again, fiddly puts down, pecks on land and chased away from it. And Harry Skelton is looking there for Rachel Blackmore. Where is she? Because I had Bristol de Mai covered. Wings the fourth last. The man nearly refuses. He's going that slow, a Plutar. And he's gone with him against the third last. Good performance for a protector at. Was it ground? I don't know what's around that soft and head. It didn't look it. I wasn't there. It just didn't look it. You're going to give me the times and tell me factually exactly what the ground was like in a second. But great performance in the winner. Good soft, I'd say. Say it was. Um, and it was interesting. Lots of people who were at Haydock were talking about the horse's demeanour beforehand. That he was quite buzzing the paddock compared to Placid 12 months ago. This is Aplutar, of course. And that he didn't want to lead the parade and that Richard Pittman made the point online that he didn't even want to go up and inspect the fence as well before the start. So I didn't see that part. I did see the parade and thought, well, was he looking at, I thought he was looking down the camera. I thought he was really looking at the camera myself <laughs> and there's a big screen behind it. So yeah, possibly, but um, I didn't see him not want to look at the first fence, but I don't think he turned up and no. compared to the Gold Cup or compared to his performance last year, 
He just didn't look the same horse. This is the betting for this year's Gold Cup in time, just to show you the reaction to what a Plutar did. He's as long as 10 to 1 in some books. Gallop into Sean is now a favourite 11 to 4. Um, Lompresse, he didn't run at the weekend, he's 10s. And Protectorat is 10s. I don't think that's a bad price for what Protectorat achieved there. I mean, Timeform described it as good enough to finish second in most Gold Cups and in some Gold Cups good enough to win. So he'd only just have to so reproduce only, his better performance. It's only good enough to be second to Lord Windermere and good enough to be second to Kato Star. I would imagine it was uh, good enough to beat Lord Windermere oh, right, and second right, to Kato right. Star. So have a look at the Gold Cup then and see what they've got to got to find. Is it how much between them? Was it 17 and a half lengths between yeah, the two of them that line? The first fence in the Gold Cup at Plutar wasn't spectacular but it's the different position in Rachel. Now he missed the water jump protector at last year's Gold Cup but down here to the third last when they land they're side by side but Rachel's hands are trying to slow him down at points in the Gold Cup. He's beside protector at away from the second last and into the third last she's behind protector at but she had travelled much better. He had jumped much better. Scoots through and protector at inside between the second last and the last. He misses the last. And look at the distance he puts between himself and protector at on this occasion. We didn't see that at Plutard and Haydock. But we probably saw it better protector exactly. than we saw in last year's Gold Cup. Exactly. Which clearly brings them closer together. And protector at's a year older, a year stronger. Um, I, th I was impressed that he managed to hold on for third, having made that mistake at, that, at the, the last at Cheltenham. Yeah, he kept going. Have Galvin, we haven't seen Manila in though since. Galvin is probably the little bit of the bogey in that form, in that cluster back there. He was very disappointed in the north. But um, we knew, just to illustrate how far off a Plutar was in Haydock last weekend, if you just watch him in 2021, yeah. it is, like, the contrast is so stark. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. What, early in the race, he's down the inside, but watch him when he lands Rachel, is trying to take him back. And this first fence in the back straight in particular, Watch his jump here. You never saw that at any stage last week in Haydock. He was just a completely different horse. And you know, even when he got in close in 2021, he was quick. But last weekend, I don't know. I mean, it was almost like Protectorat was playing the role of a Plutar from 12 months earlier, the way he That's went through That's exactly the race. what it was. Henry de Bromhead can't find any reason what, what's wrong pressing on for the Savile's chase yeah, unless they find something. A Plutar can't tell him. So it really unnerves me, very much unnerves me. And then we have Protectorat, who will be, he's only entered in the King George because um, Dan Skelton was hoping it might be abandoned for frost or snow and moved to Cheltenham. So he's got the Cotswold like Chase. It's or abandoned, it'll end up in sand now, <laughs> Cotswold Chase or the Fleur de Lis are the, are the, are the uh -huh. options. The Fleur de Lis, it's, an, it's a new conditions race uh, that Lingfield plonked on top of the existing pattern races uh, at the end of January. The first one was last year in the Winter Millions. It's worth a lot of money, Dan will tell you. So we didn't see Lompresse at Ascot on Saturday, but we are going to see him also at Newcastle this Saturday because he's carrying top weight Ruby in the rehearsal chase. Yeah, I think he's... I think he could potentially be the, 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 the best chance uh, the UK have in the Gold Cup, but I'm tired of listening to people telling me that there's a problem with the uh, graded race structure in the UK. There's this bigger one with the handicap race structure. In because the this UK. is around the same day as the Coral Gold Cup. Coral Gold Cup. Now, nobody mightn't suit him ground wise, but how can the rehearsal chase and the Coral Gold Cup be on the same afternoon, the same race, two miles, seven and a half furlongs, three miles, one and a half furlongs with no rating band? One worth 70,000, one worth a quarter of a million. Like, I just think it is ridiculous. Ridiculous, beyond ridiculous. I'm trying to find an argument against it, but no. You don't I, have I, one. I, I and what's worse, one. there's a 50 grand, two and a half mile handicap chase, yeah. either Friday or Saturday, stuck between the two handicaps in Cheltenham. Uh, let's have a look at Hitman, shall we, on Saturday? Because if Lompresse runs well in the rehearsal, he could go to the King George, he could meet Hitman. Yeah, he could, and it was a good performance. Um, good jumper, he tacked his fences, good run in the old Rhone, and he's tying with the opposition here. But if he's going to win the King George, he should be tying with this opposition. Yes. There is very little doubt about that. Fiddles when he has to, can be brave. You'd like a lot about it, but it's a big step, for me anyway, from that graduation chase to the King George. Now, Paul Nicholas trains him. He wins King George's like most people win maiden hurdles. So, it could that, well happen. That's the thing that, that is nagging me in the back of my mind. He's second favourite for, for the King George. We can have a look at the betting at the moment. Some analysts, and I'm on the fence on this, think that he doesn't find much when it's close and he's under pressure. I'd say that's harsh. I thought he kept going well at the old, in the old run in a handicap on his first start. 
And I think when you go through El Dorado Allen, I don't think that really boosted Brave Man's game with it before him when you watch him in the in the Betfair chase. I thought he ran up to that kind of kind of level. My top protector I with Absolutely Elder, for, first time out with El Dorado Allen with a run under his belt. Yeah. Did some job on him. Okay. Let's have a look at the King George betting, shall we? As I mentioned, Hitman's second in now at four to one. Brave Man's game, as you just mentioned, is five to four. Now Galloping Dichon is five to one, a point shorter than Envoi Allen. And what what do you think, Rhodes? When Gary asked uh, Willie Mullins about Galloping Dichon, do you think he's going to run? Galloping Dichon as well. How's he coming along? Yeah, a lot of talk about the King George for him. Have you heard any of that? Hey, everyone keeps ringing me about it, but. Um, <laughs> We, we we stuck him in as an entry. I don't seriously think it was a plan, so I don't. And I think we're still in the same place. It's an entry if other things will work out for him. And is Christmas likely to be the earliest we'll see him, or could you still try and get a run in beforehand? Oh, I'd like to get a run in beforehand if I could, yeah. I mean, we had toyed with the idea of going down to... Didn't we put him in the Club Oil last Thursday? I think he was in that, but then we, we thought we had enough of it. But... Um, no, he'll, he'll come as soon as I, uh, uh, yeah, I think he could run shortly, you know, so we'll see. But, and yeah, King George, I don't know, it's just an entry as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> just an entry. Was he in the club model, Ruby? Mm, no. <laughs> <laughs> he might have, Willie might have run down, but David never entered him. Um, <laughs> but no, he wasn't in the club model. Uh, King George, it is an entry. Look, we had... Was it Dan giving out last week about early closing races? Mm. Uh, I don't have a problem with them. You could make the initial entry a bit smaller uh, financially, but I think they should all be in. Enter them. If you don't put them in, they can never run in the race, and maybe the confirmation stage should financially be the biggest chunk. Mm -hmm. But I do think entries create anticipation of races, mm -hmm. and I'd make the entry fee smaller, and I'd even make them enter earlier. I would close the Grand National on the 1st of January and have the weights out on the 5th. And what would be the advantage of that, do you think? Because that means everybody has their handicap mark for the Grand National and they're encouraged us to run in the handicaps from there on and no penalties thereafter. If you happen to win with £14 up your sleeve like cock tat dib, so be it. This is another discussion, but anyway. for this moment, And again, she's no answer. <laughs> well, no, no, I, I was nodding. I think, no, there's got to be something that stops horses that are entered in the Grand National not running. That cannot be good I'd for racing, them, particularly when we're needing horses of that level. Let them in if there's... Ten line up that are theoretically well in, mm -hmm. all the better. Yeah. That is the uh, gospel according to Ruby and me. So the executives at RTV and the brains behind this whole operation have decided that I can no longer choose which ride we will analyse each week and you the roadies get to do it. So there was a poll and you had four rides to choose from, which were David Noonan, Paul Townend, Patrick Mullins and Jamie Codd and Tom Scudamore and Patrick Mullins and Jamie Codd in the bumper in Punchestown came out marginally in front of Paul Townend's masterclass and she wears it well. So here is the bumper last Sunday from Punchestown. Keto Capone on the right, Lecky Watson on the left in the red and white colours. Jamie Codd moves in and intimidates and just about bunches off Patrick Mullins round about now-ish. Then Patrick comes back out to him. He goes left, bumps off Jamie once twice and the stewards decided that they would reverse the result. I did think watching it live that, that is what would happen but now as you watch it from the overhead position slowing it down Jamie caught in the blue watch Jamie's body position he causes the first bump watch how he leans in to Lecky Watson and Patrick Mullins which creates the first bump so it's 1-0 Jamie or is Patrick one down I'm not sure whichever way you want to look at it but Jamie causes that one so first interference then by Patrick as we trip in his right hand as he drifts out and bumps off Lecky Watson. Now the important thing is, how does he react? Not quick enough because he allows Lecky Watson to interfere with Cadell Capone again and he wins by a head. Did he gain the advantage? I, it's debatable. Did the best horse win? That's still debatable. But for me, did Patrick Mullins make enough effort to straighten Lecky Watson for his experience and his ability? I'm not so sure he did. If I was assured, I would have reversed the result as well. We have a continuing novice chasing story. This is going to be a smaller section than it has been in the previous two weeks, but I'm sure there'll be plenty to say this time next week. Let's start with the Craddock's Town, shall we, Ruby? Yeah, Midnight Run uh, won the Craddock's Town. Uh, Hollowed Star was your favourite, but he got into a good rhythm in front. Now, the grey 
uh, Gordon Elliott's grand parody. He never got into a rhythm, misses the second fence, bad mistakes, the third actually, and the fourth fence. He was never really in a rhythm, which affected him. Hollow Star was your favourite down the inside, fourth last fence with Danny Mullins. He'd won at Galway, but he hurdles this one and pays the price and turns over. Mid right run had loads of experience, good jump at the third last. Mars Harper, who had traced home mighty Potter at Down Royal, is the horse in second, but the horse in front, he hadn't won in a plenty of attempts over fences. He had a lot of experience, but he was a good winner here. Not really? sure the strength of the rest, though. Yeah, he's a second season of his chase, and he'd already been beaten this season twice by Ennis Carey and once by Adamantly Chosen. Yeah. Let's talk about Kil Krutz, who's made a winning debut over fences. Yeah, and look, you're not allowed to school in public. But that's all <laughs> this fella did. Right, so he follows... Willie Wumpus down over the first, he was long, he had a good jump, only four runners, Has it, uh, gets in tight to the fence past the stands, down to the ditch, or that's the middle fence, he was good, he's brave at the ditch when Paul wants him to be, um, gets up sides, so he was following, now he's up sides, goes to the front of the fourth last, so he's done exactly what you would do at home school, leave, go up sides. And get, a, and, and get a lead and he's absolutely hosed up and uh, Willie Wumpus in fairness some tried to put it up to him but it was a good performance I think it's a better start to his season than last year's yes there's no doubt Largy debut beat him in Cork he looks mm, possibly like he's coming back to the horse he was a bumper horse yeah very good bumper horse underwhelming yeah he never hit the straps season. last season at all yeah. I think he looks that looked like the more the, that more looked like the real Kikrut. Okay, there were a couple of horses that ran, well, three actually, that ran at Ascot that caught my eye in this novice division. Starting on the Friday with Thunder Rock, who won the novices' limited handicap chase for Ollie Murphy and Adrian Heskins. Yeah, there beat he Solo, nice type. He'd won at Utoxler as well. Uh, good performance, jumped well, kept at it nicely. He's ready for graded company now, don't you think? Yeah, he's yeah. a nice type, definitely. He's rated 150 now, but also the following day in the two-mile handicap chase, the one that would have featured Edward Stone, that was one fought out by two novices, actually. Boot Hill for Johnny Burke and Harry Fry beat So Scottish for Michael O'Sullivan and Emmett Mullins. Yeah, I think Scott Scottish would probably want a little further. Agreed. I thought Boot Hill was impressive. Um, you know, it was a 150,000-mile handicap, wasn't it? Won by novices. He's ready for up and grade, though, isn't he, the winner, don't you think? Definitely, definitely, yeah. OK. We have some actual graded action as well from Ireland to bring you. This is the Florida Pearl novice chase from Punchestown. Yeah, and look, it was about Ida's boy. He missed the first. Uh, Brian Cooper didn't do much wrong. Brian as well, well, gets himself back on. Uh, but Darren's Hope, who's well enough exposed, Bob Murphy trends, only has two horses, When a good gallop in front for Danny Mullins. Now, am I right, under Rachel Blackmore on the yellow, was jumping brilliantly till the next fence. Wings by Darren's Hope there, and then drops his hind end into the ditch here and shoots Rachel forward. She does well to stay Oof. on, but am I right, then gets that cost him his chance. Ida's boy was pulled up halfway down the back. Panda boy is the grey outside him. Um, I didn't get a report after an Ida's boy, so I can't comment on it. But look, I thought Manila Kikuna was coming to beat Darren's Hope. Gets very high here at the second last. You're thinking, oh, he's a bit left in the tank. But he doesn't find anything. Now, I know he'd been off the bridle early in the race, but I was disappointed with Manila Kroonor's finishing effort. Um, I did say Kikuna a minute ago. You did, mind the Kikuna's and Kikuna's. Kikuna's and Willie's, Kikuna's and Gordon's. Um, Darren's Hope was game. Got a great reception, but I was disappointed with Manila Crooner, and am I right? Was the one I'd take out of that. Okay, I mean, we talk about uh, what's his name, a Midnight Run being experienced. That was the fifteenth chase start for Darren's Hope. Yeah, and look, she'd had a run at the stall. Um, she, she, that was her third run this season. She was considerably fitter than Manila Crooner. Am I right? Had a run under his belt as well, but I loved the way Am I Right jumped. I think for a stay in handicap chase somewhere through the season, he could be interesting. Okay. The winner, of course, uh, a mare. And as Ruby was mentioning earlier in the show, we do need to talk about the uh, mare chasers. We had uh, Dino Blue making a winning debut at Cork and Panic Attack doing the same at Huntingdon. We will catch up with them later on in the series. So that's our novice chasing retrospective. Let's go straight in to what we'll be analysing this time next week in that division. It's just a little bit of a teaser of what's going on at Newbury in particular. Three novice chases. Let's have a look at the declarations. First of all, for the limited handicap chase. There's some interesting chase debutants, Soaring Glory, Balco, Coastal, horses that have already done well over fences, the like of Frere Darms and Straw Fan Jack. Or can Risk could potentially get an easy lead? Potentially. Um, be interesting if Balco Horsley can fulfil the potential, maybe. Mm. 
And then, later on in the same card, we've got the Coral Racing Club Novices Chase. This is a grade two over two and a half miles where stage star is odds on. Camperond, he was the one that exited at the very first fence before playing an active foal at Exeter. I was impressed with Bob Porter, Carlisle. You were, I remember you saying so at the time. Following day on Saturday, we've got the Coral John Frankham Novices Chase over pretty much three miles. And there we have Time Hill taking on Jolino, Bello, McFabulous and Mortlack. That's going to be a race, isn't it? I know there's only four Harry of them. Harry Cobden's gone for Jolino, Bello over McFabulous. Mm. Um, I would agree with him. I prefer to be on Time Hill. And finally... At Navan on Sunday, we have the Bar One Racing Troy Town Handicap Chase. And the horse that's second favourite there, Ain't That A Shame, is still a novice. What did you make of his Munster National performance? He was slightly unlucky. Um, Sean O'Keefe rode him to the last fence, put down, caught the top of it and just got run out of it then. Um, it was a good effort by the big dog of, not the big dog, Peter Fife was the big dog, yeah. Um, just chinned him on the line, but you know, good performance from a novice um, and he should step forward from that. OK, well, I look forward to analysing those races this time next week. We need to move on to the social media poll. So this is what we asked you. Which of these novice hurdling performances from the past week was best? All of them from Ireland. And you had to tell us most importantly why. First of all, Ruby will give his view, starting with... A, it's what unites us at Cork last Sunday where he beat Embassy Gardens in a maiden hurdle. The two of them went the long upsides in front. It's what United us had had a run over the hurdles under his belt. He was awkward though at a couple of his hurdles early in the race. Now when they turn into the back straight and they get to the third and this is the third hurdle. Again, it's what United us is Embassy Gardens was better, but that becomes role reversal in the back straight. It's what United us pings, Embassy Garden misses at both four and five. But look, when they get across into the home straight, it's six of one half a dozen of the other. It's what United just jumps the second last. Embassy Gardens get to him. Now he flicks his tail a few times. Embassy Gardens. It's what United just missed the last dozen land running, but finds enough. Embassy Gardens tails goes again. That to me was workmanlike. Wouldn't be for that. Number two B was Monbeg Park at Punchestown. Sean Doyle's runner in the two miles and six furlong maiden hurdle. There on the right hand side. Your favourite was Seabank Bistro in the yellow and blue stripes back in fifth place. But the horse going along in front was Henry de Bromhead's top speed who brought him a, a pretty good gallop. But Monbeg Park who had a run prior to this um, was a winning point of point but didn't make the sale. Jumped the third last really well. Paul Townend landed behind him on Seabank Bistro but off the bend Monbeg Park just started to extend and pull away. Seabank Bistro fell in a hole. Will do runs on. Top speed who ran, made the run and was out with the washing. Good performance. Um, where he goes now, I don't know. I think more will be required. I would be very disappointed with Seabank Bistro. Option C was Absolute Notions, who had won last year's Landover bumper and since then has changed colours. He now runs in the Rob Core colours. And decent performance. Uh, loose horse ran around on the outside, didn't seem to affect Absolute Notions, who beat Benno was the, the top red of flat horse coming in here in JP McManus colours back in fifth. But Benno didn't really attack his hurdles, spent a lot of time in the air. He'll improve hugely for the run. Fourth last. You could say absolute notions are slightly awkward. I wouldn't worry about it. He knocked the top bar off a hurdle, so be it. Three out. Uh, he was a bit slow, a bit quicker, actually. Benno was very slow in the JP white cap. And absolute notions down to the last one, stretch, so it stretches away and goes away to win. OK, it didn't blow me away either. Um, of the three we've seen so far, I'm probably with the middle one in Monbeg Park, but I do think the best was safe to last. OK. And that is D. Irish Point winning at Cork, the first leg of a double for David Russell and Gordon Elliott. Now they hacked in this race, there's no point in trying to say anything else, they crawled up the straight and Irish Point was in front. Um, by the time they got to the fourth hurdle, his jumping had improved, they're going a bit quicker and he's jumping much slicker. The seventh hurdle he goes slightly to his right and he's a bit awkward at the second last inning. Right here, second last, he gets a little bit awkward under Davy, but I like the way this fella quickened and kept quickening. That was okay, but he didn't slow down too much. Loved him at the last, and I'm liking the distance he's putting in between himself and the rest of them. For me, I'd have gone with D. What did you, the viewers, think at home? No, they don't agree. Absolute notions. Mm. Dis are you disappointed in them? No, I'm not. No, it's just it's all about opinion, Lydia. This game, as a famous philosopher once said, what did you make of Tamuris at Haydock? Loved him. 
really, if it was one novice hurdler out of the weekend for me, it was this fella, uh, Paul Nichols' charge. I thought, look, I have size and Potsy in front, who is a highly rated chaser and really knows his business. Tamouris, not that much experience behind him for an old Failey race and syndicate. But I loved about him as here, you're thinking, oh, what's Harry Cobden got? He's squeezing him, trying to get at him, slaps him onto the bridle, size and Potsy's in front. But by the time they face up to the second last hurdle, this fella's only starting to come on the bridle. Like, I love horses, the further they go, the better they're going. And the further this fella went, the better he was going. I thought it was a really good performance. Flies the last, and away he goes to win. Yeah, he impressed me. Yeah, I agree. Uh, he already looked pretty smart at Chepstow. This was a, a step forward and build on again. I, I liked it a lot. I do too. And you have to think more. Look, that hurdle track in Haydock's on the very inside. We know it's not a wonderful race course. Can you imagine them at a proper one? A more galloping, you mean? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. OK. There's a significant race at Navon this... Did I, did I say that properly? Navon. Navon. Never this heard Sunday. it called that. No, Navon. I know. I was complimented by uh, somebody about how I pronounced about something, and now, obviously, I've completely balls it up. Navon, the Monksfield, uh, Grade 3 for Novice Hurdlers on Sunday. There are the horses uh, running. Uh, to me, it revolves around one, American Mike. Um, if we watched him winning his maiden hurdle at Down Royal uh, at the end of October, early November. Um, he was a brilliant bumper horse last year. He's conquer in the Chatham bumper. Is or could run at the weekend too. Fast Five Vigi, he holds a few entries. But American Mike, um, I loved him here. Yeah, he was very good. And I just realised I said running, whereas obviously those are the entries at this stage. Uh, but yeah, American Michael is a very good uh, bumper horse, obviously. Up against some interesting rivals. What did you make of Affidel Fury at Galway? Yeah, he, he did it well, but I'd be just thinking that if you no know, Mead's charge, look, he didn't fly the last or anything. Um, but I would be disappointed if American Mike doesn't prove. That's Monbeg Park behind him, of course, isn't it? But I'd be disappointed if no Mead's charge doesn't overturn him. It was indeed Monbeg Park. And we've got Dawn Rising as well for you to throw at you. This horse won a maiden at Listowel. Yeah, and had improved. Um, yeah, it's decent enough form, much better ground. Well, Navin could be decent ground on Sunday. There's no doubt about that. Um, but you can throw whatever you want at me. I'm in the, Mon in the American Mike camp. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, I look forward to that race at Navan. Let's see if I've pronounced that correctly this time. We've got other races to look forward to as well. We've got the long distance hurdle, the Coral long distance hurdle at Newbury tomorrow. How are you seeing that? I think it's a big test for Proshima. I You were very keen on that Weatherby run. I was. He was a decent enough flat horse, Proshima. Um, was definitely in and out as a hurdler. Uh, but I was taken with him in Weatherby. Like the way he travelled, quickened, hit the line. I think he's decent yardsticks behind him. I think they were all. No, Pashim had had a run at Chepstow, of course, but um, I, I was, yeah. Isn't he going into the big league here? I mean, he's got. Paisley that's where he has to go. You win at Weatherby, this is where you go. You step in now to the big, the big league. You run about Sharjah, getting older. Mm, Paisley it, Park. Mm. Yeah, and Champ as well. And not as old as Paisley Park, but. No, but. Champs can, champ of a horse with very little race and is older than most people would actually think. So there's how they bet with Champ the favourite at 7-4, to four, Prashima 5-2, to two, Paisley Park 4s, Dashiell Drasher who went at Aintree and will be racing over fences this season. He's 7s along with last year's winner Thomas Darby, T-Clip as the outsider. So that is what we're looking forward to amongst other things Newbury tomorrow they're running both of those days excellent meeting at Newcastle excellent racing in Ireland it's going to be a packed show this time next week thank you for your company today and you thank you very much it was enjoyable it has I been I still hope Prashima the 7 year old can beat all those 9 and 10 year olds <laughs> Well, we'll talk about that this time next week. If you're pining after something more, you can go to racingtv.com forward slash road to Cheltenham and read the column that accompanies this show. Ruby and I will see you this time next I read week. During the week, Nicky Henderson struggles to sleep. I'd say you should read that. <laughs> I think that's probably the last thing he wants to do. Bye now. <laughs>